pleasure and a duty to present to you the 2018 uh, proposed budget. And the purpose of this uh, presentation tonight is to outline all the funds, expenditures, revenues, and the highlights of the budget. You have been presented with a three ring binder of probably several hundred pages that we will go over next week uh, in an all day long retreat. Uh, for tonight's purpose, uh, we're going to take the time to go through about 58 slides that I hope will be informative not only to the council, but to be rebroadcast uh, throughout the next two weeks so the public can have the same information. So the presentation is organized in five different parts and it's an overview of budget process. Then we'll talk about deliberative democracy, fiscal sustainability, and then we'll sum up with what's left to do. So let's go over the um, basic overview. The city council approves goals every year. We have four basic goals. Within each goal, there are three objectives. So the budget that you are considering Every line item in that budget, every dollar in that budget addresses a council goal or more than one council goal. We also took the time with the city council after the election to review the goals, reauthorize the goals, and come up with five priorities, which weren't really in uh, any priority order, but there are five top items that this council wants to address. And as we go through the budget, you'll see uh, how we've proposed to do that. So 2018 at a glance will go by fund. The general fund we hope to have Lake Night Horse open for business in April. And later on we'll get into a little more detail. That's the good news. We're also strapped for cash so there are only three projects funded through the general fund, three capital projects funded through the general fund and I'll go through those in a moment. Water and sewer enterprise funds, which means that they raise revenues through rates, and that's the money they use to operate. So the city council over the last three years or so have spent a lot of effort in getting those funds at a sustainable level. So right now we're recommending a 3% increase in water and in sewer per the uh, rate study that the council adopted and this is just to maintain operations. The Transportation Enterprise Fund uh, has some difficulty, and we were all made aware earlier in the year of the state's intention to cut back each year for the next four years with a cliff at the fifth year. So we have to look at the Transportation Fund in a long-term perspective. How do we make changes in that fund to make it sustainable. Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, we want to do some better transparency by putting another line on the bill that has our sustainability program. Some people don't know. We have a pretty robust sustainability um, program. We have a full-time sustainability coordinator. And this uh, fund will require a 6% rate increase and it's a smaller amount, so you're starting with a smaller base. It's not as uh, much as water and sewer. One of the highlights of this budget that I'm proud to report is the airport fund. We've worked very, very hard in making that fund financially solvent. We've taken some tough steps, and we've suffered through some bleak years. That fund is doing very well. There's money in the bank in uh, the airport fund to address some capital projects. Uh, with the library, we would like to address with the council and the joint sales tax and the, that includes the county commission, how can we address the new circulation services supervisor position, which is one step toward getting back to seven day a week service. And that discussion has to take place, and I believe it's scheduled for next, uh, for Tuesday, October 3rd. So the bottom is uh, a summary from 2017 to 2018. The overall operating expenditures, all funds, is a decrease of 2.9%. So we're going to be spending less money operating 
than we did last year. We have several graphics in this presentation. This pie chart shows the relationship between and among all the funds. The general fund is our largest fund at 48% of our total budget of operating funds. And then water and sewer are 9 and 10% respectively. Airport 5, solid waste 3, transportation 5. Uh, then we have revenues that are uh, special revenues that can only be used for certain purposes. That's 8% of our budget. And then internal service funds are those accounting tools we use to help manage things like fleet and building repairs. The biggest portion of our budget, of the operating budget, is salaries. And we want to get that right up front so we can anticipate some questions. This morning, I gave the same presentation to our staff. We had over 200 people hearing this message, so they're not reading it in the paper tomorrow, uh, wondering what their future is. Salary increases will be based on merit. That's how we've done it for the past several years. We don't know what that merit increase will be. There's a small contingency in every one of the funds. Uh, we're doing our evaluations. When all the evaluations are submitted in November, uh, we'll take a look at what we can afford. So we're, we're going to be getting back to the council with what that number is. But in your budget, the contingency for salaries is already included. Um, Health care has steadily increased. Uh, last year, we did not have a good year in terms of claims. Claims were up. We had several large claims. So this year, in 2018, we're looking at a 16% increase. And to be fair, we're going to have to ask our employees to pay a share of that. And that could range between $1 a month and $4 a month per employee, depending on whether they're single coverage or family coverage. So I'm going to go through each of these separate funds in, in some detail, and then at the end, um, try to summarize. So let's talk about the general fund, the largest fund. Total revenues are projected at 2.5% increase. We're assuming no sales tax increase for 2018, zero. Um, this year has been very difficult for us to predict it's been erratic. It's been weak. Uh, I'm sure all of you have talked to merchants. We've talked to people on the street. There are a lot of factors that we can uh, use to explain this. The message is buy local. Be conscious of uh, internet sales. Only use the internet as a purchase of last resort. But there are other things in the regional economy that may be contributing to this. Licenses and permits, 1% growth. Charges for services, 20.5% uh, uh, increase. That's largely due to opening up Lake Nighthorse. We're anticipating $300,000 collected at the gate for people going into Lake Nighthorse. On the expenditure side in the general fund, a slight increase, 0.7%, $289,000. And then personnel uh, will uh, contribute um, or, or be about a an increase about 1.4 million, and that's mostly the merit increases. Well, that is the merit increases, a couple new positions, and uh, health insurance. In staffing, uh, the net change is four and a half new positions. There are only three capital projects in the general fund. The transfer from the general fund to the capital projects fund, 17 to 18, is going down 1.3 million. Tourism fund uh, is the lodger's tax. Uh, that is projected to go up 16.6%. We're going to maintain the funding for Durango Transit at $250,000. Uh, Dato, the Durango Area Tourism Office, will get a 3% increase. Uh, in past years, we have uh, given Dato an increase equivalent to the general fund increase. Uh, this year, it's a little bigger than that. General fund is only 0.7%. Um, but they have, uh, they've done a good job, and that represents inflation. And then we're taking 100000 uh, to fund those special events that bring out tourists from the outside, outside of Durango,
for example, the 4th of July, Iron Horse, and Snowdown. Water, um, total revenues will decrease 7.9%, and I'll get into more detail when we get to the water fund. Residential and commercial rates will go up 3%, and operating expenditures will decrease by 0.7%, or 26000 There's a new position proposed, a uh, project manager, and this will be shared water and sewer fund 50-50. We have a backlog of projects in water and sewer. We're also proposing some new projects. We need someone to take responsibility for packaging these and bird dogging all these projects. This would be an engineer reporting to uh, Levi Lloyd, the director of operations. Uh, we had a position called utilities management analyst. Uh, we're eliminating that. We've never filled it. Uh, we uh, made a decision to hire the assistant director, Jared Biggs. We don't need this position anymore, so we're going to uh, eliminate it. And transferring 600000 less uh, to capital projects. In sewer, total revenues are up a little, uh, 2.6. Rates go up 3. Uh, expenditures increase 11.5. Uh, we have the new project manager, and we're adding one new sewer plant man sewer operator uh, for the ridge, uh, for the Santa Rita uh, water reclamation project. And then we anticipate again in 2019 to add another one. We want to bring people on board as the plant is being built, so the training they get is from the ground up. And we're eliminating that same utilities uh, management analyst. The transfer to uh, capital is down by one and a half million, but remember the construction project of the new sewer plant is all consuming. We have all of our staff meeting several times a week. That is our number one priority. We have to demonstrate to the public that we can deliver a project within budget and on time, uh, and that is critical for us to make that work. We start paying on the project, uh, so we make our first debt service payment, $3.4 million. Airport is a great story. Their revenues are up. Their parking revenues increase 2.9%. Uh, we think that they will generate more in parking revenues at the airport than we will collect in property taxes. Operating expenditures are up slightly, 1.2%. They're fully staffed. The director has just hired an operations manager. They're ready to rock and roll in 2018. Capital projects of 815000 have been vetted through the airport commission. They're ready to get these smaller projects underway. Solid waste. The uh, total revenues are up 5.7%. We've had several discussions recently about bears and changing over our inventory of bear-proof or wildlife-resistant containers. That's in process. We need a 6% increase. Um, operating expenditures are up just slightly, a half a percent. And we're going to, uh, through better transparency, display our sustainability program on the bills. There's no staffing changes. We have one capital project, and that's to get some engineering um, support to look at the feasibility of PV solar on city facilities and on a couple city-owned properties. Transportation services is a challenge. Revenues are down uh, almost 2%. Uh, the grant we get from the feds through the state is going down. We think parking revenue will stay stable. Operating expenses go up about 3.2% or 113000 this fund is not financially sustainable. We've tried different things. We raised rates last year. We're going to have to look at a combination of a revenue source, cutting services, or, or some blend of the two. There are no staffing changes in your budget. And I'd like to explain to the council that we would like to take a little more time, maybe uh, another um, three or four more months to get a program of transition to a sustainable level and not do something drastic immediately. I think the council is going to want to spend a little more time 
uh, looking at our options, getting more public engagement, and we'll do that and make the change in the spring instead of immediately. It also transfers 97,000 for capital projects. These are your routine uh, projects around town the, to run the bus system. Um, this little graphic uh, is kind of cutesy. It uh, is it make a good placemat for uh, for kids that are in elementary school. It depicts um, our activities. We do a lot of things for the public. Not only do we provide a high level of service, but we provide a variety of services that you don't find in most municipalities. And I would thank the Public Information Office for adding the bear and the wildlife resistant trash can. One of our biggest challenges is dog poop, and that's at the lower part of this graphic. So we've included uh, everything the council gets calls on. I'll take a minute to uh, describe our organizational chart. We've had a change uh, at a very high level, but the city council is elected by the public. And in turn, the council is uh, responsible to hire three people, the municipal judge, the city attorney, the city manager. The city manager is responsible under the charter for all of the employees and personnel. We now have two assistant city managers. Uh, the assistant city manager that's to the left uh, is Amber Blake, and she is responsible for transportation, 911 dispatch, human resources, administrative services, and the airport, and a lot of special assignments, including liaison with CDOT and uh, being the, uh, the front person on our uh, citizen engagement programs. And then Kevin Hall has mostly community development related, building related, development related uh, enterprises, including all the planning functions, business development, sustainability, building inspection, engineering, code enforcement, parking, housing, and engineering. And then the uh, core uh, departments that report to me are police, finance, library, city operations, parks and rec. Uh, the city manager's executive assistant, who's in the middle, actually runs the city. That's Karen Pease. We all depend on her. If that went away, uh, we'd have a problem. Uh, staffing changes. This is a summary of the general fund. We've eliminated two positions. Well, three. Uh, the chief strategy and innovation officer position and two library ba branch managers that are, were part-time to the equivalent of 1.5 FTE. Then we add back an engineering tech and community development. And then the next five positions called out are all parks and rec. Three of those are for Lake Nighthorse. The last position in the general fund really is part of the joint sales tax, which flows into the general fund. And that's the circulation services supervisor that I mentioned previously. And then when you skip over to water and sewer, there's uh, elimination of the utilities management analyst position. And then we add in the project manager and one sewer plant operator. So now let's talk about the budget process. There are three main considerations for financial su sustainability. The first is we're seeing an increased demand for service. Uh, the public is accustomed to a high level of service. We're accustomed to providing it and being responsive. We're also facing challenges with deferred maintenance. We are consuming our capital investments faster than we can replenish them. We need to be putting more into our buildings, more into our streets, more into curb and gutter, sidewalks. Uh, we don't even have uh, the results of the stormwater management plan, which will bring into the focus um, the needs for drainage, better drainage. And the third consideration here is, what is the behavior of sales tax? The term that I like to use is elastic. When the economy is booming and things are going well, sales tax expands and we can do a lot of different things. When the economy constricts, then we have less revenue. So that elasticity allows us to ramp up quickly, but it also means when the economy restricts, we have to cool down quickly, and that's where we are in 18. This slide is, is hard to read. I'm, I'm not going to read all the bullet points, but it, it's going to be posted on the city website. 
Balancing the budget is no longer good enough. What we ought to be doing is balancing the budget and looking to make sure those decisions put us in a position long term to be successful in the future. Some members of council who have been on six and a half years inherited some issues with water and sewer rates and had to catch up. So we would like the council to consider a council 10 years from now and setting them up for success. We have some communication uh, difficulties to overcome. Uh, we have a legal requirement they'll have to follow for adopting the budget. We've added an extra public meeting on the budget, but in general, the public is unaware of this process. And public input is typically adversarial uh, and polarized. And it, the input we get and what we react to is typically to emphasize analysis and not leadership. So we have an opportunity here to step up to leadership. We don't have a budget problem. We have an opportunity to improve the public decision-making process. We can balance at the staff level by trading off different accounts and reflecting the council priorities, but we can't sustain that forever with the increased um, demands for service. We need more public outreach and engagement. Last week was a good start with the uh, Cities and Towns Week. So let's talk about that. The term we use here is deliberative democracy. It's a um, philosophy of how do we encourage and involve the public. And these ideas come from different sources, but this professor at CSU is probably a, uh, the best source uh, in uh, the country right now, and he's the head of the Center for Public Deliberation at uh, CSU. And uh, I just received this magazine, Public Management Magazine, in the mail yesterday. And what do we have as the lead article is Taming Wicked Problems. I have copies for the council. And the term wicked problem is what Professor uh, has uh, made more popular. So what's the typical public process in Durango? It's engagement comes too late in the process. We're under a deadline to uh, adopt the budget by December the 5th. When someone comes to the podium on the 5th, it's really hard to change the budget. Uh, and we're also framing things as yes and no, win or lose. What we should try to expand into is how do we get a more deliberative process? And to do that, we have to build capacity for wisdom, collaborative action, and co-creation. We don't have all the ideas. We need to get more ideas on the table. The council is elected to represent the public, and we have to make some decisions on that. But collaboration is what should lead us into those discussions. And we should differentiate between strong and weak arguments instead of giving them equal value. There, there, we get some ideas that don't muster, pass muster, because the public isn't aware of all the things that go into uh, running a city. So that has to rely on building that mutual understanding of respect. We have to respect what we get from the public, and they, in turn, need to respect the hard work that the council has to do to make these decisions. Listening to the public is important, and, and it's the only way we're going to move forward if we're going to be successful over time. Cities and Towns Week was a lot of fun. Thanks to all of you who participated. Um, we collected a lot of data, and we had over 15 public events. We're putting that all together in a report, and we hope to get back to you uh, at a study session uh, soon in October. So let's go back to uh, uh, Dr. Carcassonne's uh, tame and wicked problems. Tame problems are essentially technical. That's what the staff does. We, we basically work in a technical area. Greg Boyson can tell you how big the pipe should be, um, where the stop signs ought to be. Julie Brown can tell you how we account for different funds. Uh, Amy has all the public records. Basically technical. 
and we're expert at those uh, functions. We're subject matter experts. We can divide TAME problems into manageable parts. That organizational chart, city manager doesn't know how to do everything. You divide it up. We have two assistant managers, we have department heads, we have subject matter experts underneath the departments that everything comes up and the council gets pretty good staff reports about pros and cons for any course of action. The challenge here is the wicked problems. These are wicked problems because they're conflicts in values. And I'm going to go through some examples of wicked problems. And after I do, you're going to think about wicked problems that you deal with. But they call for high quality communication, creativity, broad collaborative action for resolution. So here's a wicked problem, housing. We want affordable housing. We want workforce housing. We have to address homelessness. We ought to do redevelopment. Well, if we add a fee, that makes the housing less affordable. And if we don't add the fee, maybe the fire department can't put money aside for future uh, expansions. We want to preserve neighborhoods. That may restrict the density of that neighborhood, uh, which means less affordable housing. So these are conflicts of values. During um, Cities and Towns Week, we had three buckets. We had infrastructure, facilities, and then we had the um, um, broadband and other, what was it called, digital communications and security. So we asked people to think of those three buckets. Where would you put your money? Well, one of the biggest challenges uh, we face is how does the public understand where we are with the condition of our buildings? We have a facilities report. The police station presents an opportunity to be the first domino. If we can fix the police, this, not really fix that building, but get them in a facility, um, then that allows us to move other people around. Talked about transportation. The reality here is the federal government is giving less money to the states. The states have to reprioritize. They have some, in, in Colorado, have some very, very difficult choices. And so it's going to come down to us to make those choices locally. Now, we can be um, trying to solve it technically with, as a tame problem, or we can look at the values and come up with Let's just get to the bottom line. We know where we're going to be. Um, let's not kid around with that. So tough, tough, wicked problem. Library. We have a $17 million asset. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves the library. It's the cornerstone of culture in the community. It's closed on Sunday. It's a non-performing asset. How do we get that open? How do we get the library um, those conflicts resolved. Where are the priorities? Where are the values? And I, and I should mention that um, uh, Melissa and I and Sandy Irwin were at uh, Zia at, during uh, Cities and Towns Week, and we had a, a little girl um, tell us that if the library was open 24 hours a day, they could have sleepovers. <laughs> Another wicked problem is uh, La Plata County, and I, I'm trying to say this in a positive way. But the county has a tough um, challenge. Uh, they've had to cut some things that they really don't want to cut, like youth program, youth scholarships, branch libraries, uh, charging for service uh, for the Plata Youth Services. As the manager of almost 350 full-time employees, I worry about what happens if the county can't provide services out in the county where our people live. Maybe they can't come to work. Maybe the schools can't open because the snow removal um, is an issue. Uh, that means our employees stay home with childcare and they're not here doing the job. So there are concerns to operate the city because most of our employees live outside the city because it's not affordable to live in the city. Um, and we've had uh, two road and bridge levies rejected and the 9R bond rating has been lowered by uh, bond rating agencies. So that's, that's a, a challenge. Uh, with respect to uh, sustainability, we're trying to find a balance in the triple bottom line. We have to look at 
what's the economic value? What's, is there a social justice issue here? The council makes a decision. Is that benefiting one group over another? How do we deal with that? Uh, and then we have to protect the environment and the climate is an issue. So this budget tries to move us toward economic sustainability. Back to the general fund. We are running on empty. We have depleted our fund balance and that little sliver of um, unappropriated fund balance is getting, uh, it's just small, it's just tiny. Our service demands keep increasing and we really need to consider some additional funding source uh, and that's part of this wicked problem and deliberative process that we have to take um, seriously. Solving wicked problems means we address the problem and not attribute blame to wicked people. The council frequently gets blamed for everything, and that's not fair. It's not fair to blame staff. It's not fair to blame the public. We all have to come to an understanding that we're all here to solve the problem. And that means improving the, this public discourse and that conversation not winning the argument. We're not proving that we're smarter than somebody. What we need to do is make progress on that particular goal and why these values interact and how one value uh, needs to be considered over another. We need to put the civic energy toward identifying and finding better ways to negotiate these tensions. The budget process we follow is prescribed by the state. It's modified by the city charter. We get one or two people showing up at the public hearing. Um, we have 18,000 residents. That's not a successful process. So let's talk about fiscal sustainability. In the general fund, 58% is elastic revenues. That's our sales tax. So when things are good, we are able to do a lot of things. When we're in neutral, which is where we are now, um, we should look at the budget with caution. The other components here, and I would call out property tax, uh, is only 4%. I, I, was, uh, I was not surprised, but all the people I talked to last week, um, they assumed that their property tax bill is the city's bill. And there's every line, mosquito district, school district, uh, it's all our problem. Uh, but we only get about $1.3 million in property tax. The mill rate, so a tax is the base times the rate that equals the revenue. So the tax base, we've done a nice job expanding the tax base. Things, things are in planning, there's a lot of development coming through. The tax rate, the property tax rate has not changed since 1982. So this bar graph is from 2009, which was the beginning of the Great Recession, showing um, where our revenues have gone with sales and use taxes. Use tax is a very small portion of the sales and use tax um, item. And it's the use tax that's carrying us with a slight increase in 18. It's not the sales tax. Sales tax is zero. This chart shows why we need to consider a process, why we need to consider all of our options through working with the public. Going back to 2008, these two lines depict revenues compared to expenditures. So in 2012, uh, we were spending more than we were taking in. And that was on purpose. And if you remember why, we had gone through um, the Great Recession. We cut back 37 positions. We cut uh, capital projects. In 2012, we started using money out of the fund balance to catch up. We put a lot of money into streets. And where we are today is we've got a balanced budget, revenues versus expenditure. We're not putting more money away for a rainy day. 
But going forward, in 2020, those lines change again. And if our projections are correct or even close, we're going to be spending more money than we're taking in without any fund balance. And that we can't do that. So here's an example of, of capital improvements. In, in 15, 2015, we're putting $3.7 million toward capital improvements. In 18, 825000 That's $2.8 million less uh, over three years. That's not sustainable. This is how it looks on a bar chart. And I have to uh, admit that this is one of my favorite slides of all time. Um, I confess that. Uh, this shows the funded and unfunded capital projects. The funded uh, projects are in blue, and the unfunded are in that orangey color, peachy color. What it doesn't show are the unidentified project needs $200 million. That $200 million we don't even put on the table because we don't think we have any chance of getting a new city hall. We don't have any chance of building new bridges. We don't have any chance of doing all these big things. There's 200 million out there at some time a future council will need to address. So the sustainability uh, topics, infrastructure, deferred maintenance, water, sewer, and transportation, we need to focus on those, look at the future for those, and come up with a plan in this dialogue with the public. So let's go through some of these uh, in a little more detail. When we talk about infrastructure, here's what we maintain. 265,000 square feet of buildings, 4,200 street signs, 380 miles of asphalt pavement, 305 pieces of rolling stock, now, most of our rolling stock is not a car like you and I drive. It's a pretty complicated piece of equipment uh, that requires a lot of maintenance, and it gets used a lot. So after the city employees, our biggest asset is our infrastructure. Let's take a look at streets. So in 2014, the components of streets, alley paving, ADA ramps, surface treatment, overlays, reconstruction, was a little over two million. From 2014 to 2018, drops down. The red line shows the needs in the CIP for streets. So the delta between in 2018, where that red line goes, at uh, about 2.4 million to the 840,000, that's the gap that we're not addressing for streets. We do a pavement condition index. And that means uh, we have a contractor with a van that has specialized cameras. They drive every street. Each street is given a grade, just like from school, A through F. And then we use that information to determine, are we going to repave it? Are we going to rebuild it? Are we going to crack seal? Are we going to do a surface treatment? We have that much of a gap in streets. Another tool that we've used in the past with the city council is we have high impact versus low impact. We have low cost versus high cost. And if you look at the street treatments, for example, what is the return on investment? If we reconstruct a street, it's high impact, it's high cost. So our effort should be to take action when it's cheaper to do a crack seal, to do a chip seal. If we can stop the deterioration at an earlier stage, it's kind of like a medical thing, you know? If you can catch something before it gets critical, you can work with it. But when we get to the reconstruction, uh, it's the most expensive option. High impact, high cost. That's Thomas Drive. Uh, we also have um, low impact, low cost. When we stripe a street, boy, we get a lot of, we, I hate to use the term mileage, we get a lot of mileage on that. Uh, college uh, is looking uh, at a study uh, on, on college that uh, we would go from four lanes to three. 
Well, in some communities, you move the curb and move the sidewalk. Well, what we're planning to do is stripe bike lanes, stripe a new uh, center turn lane. That's low impact, low cost. So on the enterprise funds, um, I believe there's a typical uh, utility payer uh, sitting in the room. And she would pay this year about $110, $110, sorry, uh, $110 a month for utilities. And with these rates that were quoted earlier, 3%, 3%, 6%, it goes to 114. The water and sewer funds, um, capital improvements, uh, have a lot of detailed projects. Uh, on the water side, it's 2.8 million. On the sewer side, 575,000, plus a $64 million plant. And I would also reiterate that it's the same staff. They wear two hats in some cases. When we send a, a staff uh, truck to repair a pipe, they're doing water and sewer. So why do we need a project manager? And that person is needed to address and manage water and sewer capital improvement projects. The largest project we've ever undertaken is the Santa Rita Water Reclamation Facility. We have a lot of staff on that. Finance, city manager's office, planning, engineering, uh, wastewater. Um, we have 64 ongoing capital projects, 47 water, 17 sewer, and having this type of position will allow us to systematically go through to tame problem. It's technical in nature. There's a sequencing a person as a project manager will bring to the table. We're overwhelmed with these projects. We need help. So here's uh, a photo that was taken uh, a little over a week ago. The, it's shooting straight down into the aeration basin. Uh, this facility is 200 feet long, 150 feet wide, and it'll be about 25 feet deep. The lighter colored portion uh, to the north uh, is concrete that was poured, 55 truckloads, so 5,500 yards, cubic yards of concrete. The middle portion, which is um, gray, was poured last week another 55 trucks. And we're gonna pour the third portion uh, in a few days, another 55 trucks, and that's just to pour the floor. It's an immense project, and if, if some of you were trying to find concrete to do your own project, it's all right here. Uh, it's bringing uh, a challenge to the concrete plant. They can't make it anymore, can't produce it. So with the transportation budget, we really have three things to look at. We can reduce or eliminate services, we can increase revenue, we can combine the two. That's not a pretty picture. We've been through it for the last three years or so. At least now we know what the state is thinking and it's not good, it's not good for us. And we need to have um, that community dialogue to give some information and input to make a good decision. So I'm um, getting toward the end, so what's left? Uh, this is the change in the fund balance. So in 2017, the fund balance will change about 612,000. That's how we think we're, we're gonna end the year at about 7.2 million. In 2018, we start off the year at 7.2. We think we'll end the year at 7.7. .7. And that's a change of 478,000. So let's look at it as a pie chart. Tabor is money required by the state constitution that we literally can't touch. And then the council wisely has, uh, by policy, um, asked us to put a two month reserve. So if anything happens in the White House, who knows? We have two months of reserve that we can float around until we can stabilize. That leaves unassigned $153,000. $153,000. In 17, we started with $17,000, if you remember. So here's where we are today. Uh, we've done um, council goal setting. 
at, uh, earlier in July and August. We did a public workshop on the budget in July. We've had Cities and Towns Week. Today you received that big booklet. So looking forward, uh, on October the 3rd uh, was a joint meeting with the Board of County Commissioners. And we'll talk about joint sales tax and airport. And then on the 5th, all day with the council, going through every line item in the budget at your annual budget workshop. October 10th, we bring in all the CIP projects, so you can go through those in more detail. The 24th, we look at community support, DATO, excuse me, and BID. Then the public hearing on the budget. And then on the 14th of November, reconciliation. So for the benefit of the public, as the council goes through the budget, there are questions that we can't answer at that particular time. There are also assignments that the council makes to staff. And we take those and we park them, we call it parking lot list. So on the 14th of November, we reconcile all of those items. And then the council provides direction on what stays in and what, um, what their decisions are. And then on the 5th uh, is the budget adoption on the 5th of December. So with that, I thank you for your time and patience and would like to uh, close my presentation and then we will um, 